Good afternoon, everybody. I think you should all be able to hear me okay. Welcome to today's wellness break. Um, again, my name's Crystalline Montgomery. If you haven't joined us before, um, work with the UMP Psychiatry Integrative Wellness Team. I'm a naturopathic doctor and licensed acupuncturist. Um, and these wellness breaks that we are hosting uh, throughout the summer are designed to provide people with an opportunity to um, hear a little bit more about common questions, common topics um, that you, know, you might see within the news um, or you might have heard um, people discussing and, and they all have some relevance to our health and, and wellness, some various topics that we've decided to discuss. I've been fairly open to discussing various topics. I like to hear from people in terms of what questions or topics might be of interest to them. What I have started off with these first few weeks are topics uh, that I hear from other people. They, they involve questions, common questions I get from people, things that I commonly find myself uh, explaining or, or talking to people about um, throughout day to day. So today's um, topic is going to be emotions, neurotransmitters, and hormones, and how we can support our hormones and our mental health. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about the connection between hormones and neurotransmitters and how that impacts our emotional um, well-being and mental health. Um, for those that have not joined us in the past, here's kind of a look at what we've done so far. We've been meeting every Monday from 12.15 to about one o'clock. I try to make sure things are wrapped up. First, first few sessions were on nutrition and resilience. Then we talked about magnesium. Last week was a lot of fun. We talked about the microbiome and probiotics. Um, this week, we're going to talk about hormonal health as it relates to mental health. Um, we're not going to meet next week, but then after that, we're going to come back and talk about optimizing sleep. And then we'll do a little bit of discussion about um, key nutrients and foods for immune health. So if you've not made it to one of the sessions, or if you know you cannot make it to a session, it doesn't work for your schedule, or if you know somebody that would really like to listen in and they just can't make this time and day work, um, up here in the right-hand corner, um, there is an email address psychwellness at umn.edu. And if you email that, um, we can ensure that you're being sent a link after the fact, because I always upload them to YouTube where people can watch them after the fact. Um, it's, a, it's a hidden link though. So if you were to just go onto YouTube and search it, it, it likely wouldn't show up. So you need the link to go view it. Um, secondly, I want to encourage people to ask questions. Um, while these sessions would normally take place in person and offer a really great opportunity to have sort of a face-to-face -face discussion, um, we are trying to make the best of technology. So I will encourage you, if you do have a question come up throughout today's talk, go ahead and type it into the chat box and I'll be keeping an eye on that. And I will go ahead and answer questions as they come up. If it's something I think we'll talk about later, um, I'll let you know. So without any further ado, today um, I might have been a little ambitious in thinking about today's topic, um, but we're gonna try to get through it and uh, see if I can answer some common questions. Uh, we're gonna talk about how neurotransmitters and hormones impact our emotional health and mood. Um, part of where this stems from is um, I'm often working with people around balancing mental health and we're trying to address all the factors that could affect their mental health and not uncommonly what comes up is hormonal health. And we often see this interconnection between hormones and neurotransmitters, which then impact emotional health and well-being. Um, so we're going to talk very briefly about that and how, that, how those are all connected. But more importantly, we're going to spend time talking about what are hormone-supportive foods, um, how can we support a balanced endocrine system or hormonal system at home. So again, we're looking for simple, easy techniques we can um, enact that we can, we can do right from our own home, nothing fancy, um, just basic stuff, basic tools. So how are the hormones, the brain, chemicals, and mood connected? Well, 
it gets complicated. Um, there's a lot of ways that these things are all interconnected. You know, what we typically think of when we think of brain health or when we think of mood are this lower circle down here, which has neurotransmitters. So we commonly think of serotonin, GABA, epinephrine, dopamine. These are just a handful. There are many more brain chemicals um, that are involved with mood regulation. Um, what's interesting is these levels of neurotransmitters or brain chemicals can definitely be impacted and they can uh, in turn impact um, things like hormones and both hormones and neurotransmitters are equally impacted by stress. And so this is a common triad that I often work on with people and I find it helps to talk briefly about the connection between the three because sometimes when people hear about that connection, it helps them make better sense of um, sort of emotional ups and downs they might have, or um, perhaps if someone's dealing with depression or anxiety, um, you know, it helps them put it into um, context and help them understand other factors that might be influencing it. So one thing I'll note is that stress most definitely can impact both neurotransmitter levels and hormone levels. And the biggest factor, the biggest hormone, stress hormone we often deal with is cortisol. And I'm sure many of you have heard of cortisol and you're familiar with it. It's that stress hormone, that fight or flight hormone that gets released when our body perceives it's under stress. Now that stress could be a lot of different things. And so this is sometimes what I have to work on with people is identifying sources of stress. Um, and we'll get to this a little bit later. We can't always take away all stress. So that's not always the point. But the point is, is if there is something, a stressor we can identify that we can change, then we work to change that. If it's something we know we can't change, then how can we support the body's ability to adapt and be resilient in the face of that stress? But what happens is hormones start to play a role more and more with mental health because they are, um, depending on where someone is at in the stage of life, um, hormones are going to be more or less active. And so if you have someone, say, that is in the earlier stages of life, maybe uh, definitely as a teenager, but then as a young adult, you're going to have, in general, higher levels of all of the hormones. They, they tend to be produced in higher amounts earlier on in life. Now, as people age, the natural aging process um, throughout the natural aging process, the levels of these hormones goes down. And so this is when I start to explain to people that your body might experience changes in hormones. As it experiences changes in hormones, it might experience changes in mood. And that's because we actually see things like estrogen levels will definitely impact things like histamine. So some of my patients who are in the prime of producing estrogen in their bodies, um, especially a lot of females or people who identify as females and have high estrogen levels, they will notice that histamine-like symptoms get um, worse or better depending on where they are in their menstrual cycle. And that is because we know that estrogen will trigger the release of histamine and that can aggravate certain symptoms. Now, some of those symptoms are more like allergy-like symptoms kind of stuffy nose, maybe sneezing, maybe a rash, maybe headaches. But some of those, um, histamine can also be kind of uh, excitatory in the brain. So sometimes people feel a little anxious if they have too much histamine in their, in their body. So oftentimes when someone comes in and they're noticing cyclical anxiety, I'll say, well, let's make sure your estrogen levels are in check. Um, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about how to do that. Likewise, if estrogen levels go up, um, and progesterone levels don't go up with them, especially for females, um, progesterone has this very calming uh, effect on the body. And it often will support GABA levels. And GABA is that calming neurotransmitter. And so for some people, if they're feeling extremely anxious, sometimes I have to spend some time balancing their estrogen and progesterone levels. Same thing with testosterone. For um, especially people who are identifying as men or males, they will, they tend to produce more testosterone throughout life. Um, as they age, they might produce less testosterone, but even more so we have to watch for effects of lower testosterone levels, or if their body's inadvertently converting um, testosterone um, to estrogen. 
and their body might be producing too much estrogen. And that's becoming more common in males nowadays. Um, but one other thing I'll note is that as stress levels go up, we have to remember cortisol levels can have a huge impact downstream in the body. Um, you know, initially it's doing all the things to help us get through stress. Now that is fine. If as long as that stressor is short lived, if it continues for a long period of time and we're kind of chronically stressed day after day, over time, our body starts to adapt to that. And so what will happen is cortisol will start to inhibit melatonin. And we all know melatonin helps us sleep at night, but melatonin is also this very powerful antioxidant and it helps with healing and recovery of tissues. Um, also helps us maintain a healthy metabolism. You know, if we get too much cortisol in our body over a long enough period of time, it starts to throw off insulin levels and glucose regulation. And so oftentimes people start to experience that sort of what we call central adiposity, which is in other words, kind of that quote unquote belly fat, which isn't my, my favorite term, but that's the way people commonly know of it. They're like, gosh, no matter how much I work out or no matter how much I eat, I, I seem to, you know, there's this thing around my belly button that just doesn't really go away. That is sort of an effect of long-term cortisol exposure. Um, so over time, you know, your body is going to adapt certain ways. Now, to be clear, your body is designed to withstand the effects of stress, especially when they're short term. But we just have to think about this is where we have to step back and look at our overall life and try to understand, do I get enough rest and recovery from those stressors? So it might seem complicated. It is complicated. What I just the overview I just gave you is a very, very simplified overview. You know, we could easily spend loads of time talking about that, which might be fun for me, maybe less fun for you. But the point is, it doesn't have to be complicated. So what I try to explain to people is let's prioritize uh, some things here so that it doesn't feel overwhelming. And I say, first of all, let's try to regulate stress. You know, is there too much? And this sometimes is the hardest thing. Sometimes people just have too much on their plate. And so we have to step back and say, is, is there anything we can take off your plate? Or can you delegate? Um, if it's not possible to delegate or take something off your plate, well, then we've got to just figure out ways, strategies to support your recovery from stress, your resilience. And then the last point is what we're really going to talk about the most today is decreasing inflammation and exposure to endocrine disruptors. So these are the things we probably have the most control over um, in terms of these are things that can sort of exacerbate uh, hormonal imbalances, which can then exacerbate certain uh, imbalances in brain chemicals and inflammation, which can then exacerbate um, our mood balance and our overall well-being. So supporting hormones and your mood from home. I try to focus on these four main points. One, sleep. I think we all understand this. We get this. Um, this is something we are going to cover in a couple of weeks um, because I think there's a, luckily a lot more people are becoming informed about sleep hygiene and how to get good sleep. But I still think despite that, it's probably one of the most common things I have to work on with people because uh, sleep and quality sleep is so important to help our body recover. Um, the second point is equally as important, moving your body. Um, now, aiming for 30 minutes a day, that's sort of the, the minimum that we're aiming for. And it's hard. I think for those of us that have maybe desk jobs, it's hard to get up and move your body. We really have to set an intention and almost put it into our schedule to get up and move. Now, that 30 minutes doesn't have to be all at once. That 30 minutes could be broken up. I tell some of my people, hey, why don't you schedule a 10 minute break every one to two hours? Now in an ideal world, they recommend um, getting up at least once an hour to move around, move your body. That could be going for a brisk walk. That could be just standing next to your desk and just kind of shaking or bouncing in place. That could be doing a quick stretch. Um, it could be just kind of rolling your shoulders out. Um, but the more you sort of get into your body and actually activate those muscles, even better if you can get your heart rate up. And then the third point, scheduling time for mindfulness. Now, this can look a lot of different ways for people. Um, you know, I have some people that just absolutely don't do well with sitting and meditating. That doesn't work for their body. I have others who love that. Um, I have a lot of people where I'm constantly encouraging them to try to do 
uh, mindful movement, such as Tai Chi, yoga, Qigong, um, or doing different body work sessions like acupuncture, massage therapy, um, mostly because those are things that sort of force you to get out of your head and into your body. And I think a lot of times that's where I see people needing to go. Sometimes we are so caught up in our head and we're always thinking and strategizing and, and we're really smart and we know a lot, but sometimes it's less about thinking our way out of it and more about activating muscles in our body, um, sort of retraining the cells in our body on a physical level. And then the last point we're going to cover in depth is eating anti-inflammatory foods, including superfoods. And then at the tail end, we'll also cover sort of trying to work towards reducing exposure to different endocrine disruptors. So the superfoods, now for those that haven't been with us the past uh, few weeks, I'm gonna in actually encourage you to, you know, when you have a moment, go back and watch some of the previous videos because I've given multiple lists of different foods that we can eat to support our well-being. And um, in the first session I did, we talked a lot about the anti-inflammatory quote unquote diet or anti-inflammatory foods. That is a wonderful list to utilize as sort of a starting point. Like what are some foods that I can eat that are gonna support um, decreased inflammation in my body? These foods here are foods that when I think about people that we really need to balance our hormones and I'm seeing some signs of hormone imbalance, um, I want to make sure people are getting these into their daily intake in some way, shape, or form. So the first one is brassica or cruciferous vegetables. These are like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, kale, um, fresh broccoli sprouts. So these contain indole 3 carbonyl, which once you put that into your body, it converts into something called diindolyl methane. And sulforaphanes are also in these foods. These are really powerful compounds that support healthy hormone uh, balance and healthy estrogen levels because there's different types of estrogens and some types of estrogens are good for the body. Some types of estrogens are, we want a little bit less of, they're not, they're a little bit more proliferative or they're types of estrogens we just want to keep in check. Um, one thing to note is with the brassica and cruciferous vegetables, you'll notice I say, let's keep them lightly steamed or sauteed. I get a lot of people who ask questions about, well, what if I have a thyroid condition? I heard I'm not supposed to eat these foods. Um, if you have a thyroid condition, like a hypothyroid, you know, it's recommended that you minimize eating these foods in raw form. Once you cook these foods, you've deactivated some of the compounds that can inhibit thyroid function. So I explained to people, I'm not worried at all about people um, who have maybe a hypothyroid condition or Hashimoto's eating these foods as long as they're lightly steaming them or cooking them. Um, broccoli sprouts generally don't do well cooked. Those are pretty easy. One could even sort of sprout them on their own at home, especially over the winter time when we don't have quite the same access to fresh leafy greens locally. Um, but generally I don't cook those. Those are best eaten fresh. Um, ground flax seeds. Uh, these are great for a host of reasons. Um, usually I have people buy them whole and, and then grind them in a coffee grinder at home. If you buy them ground in the grocery store, already ground, that's fine. Just make sure they're refrigerated because they contain fatty acids that are anti-inflammatory. And those fatty acids are pretty sensitive to air and heat. So we just wanna make sure that they're in a vacuum sealed package or they're in the refrigerated section if they're already ground. If someone's gonna grind them on their own, I say go ahead and grind uh, you know, a cup's worth or a week's worth and then put it in the fridge, whatever, whatever you don't use. And then you can just take out one or two tablespoons add it to a smoothie and we'll talk about some ideas about what to do with them. But the reason why I like them is they contain the fatty acids, as I said, they're also a really great source of fiber um, and fiber is necessary for helping bind to excess hormones, especially estrogen in the bowels so your body can eliminate it. Um, it also contains lignans, which again, support healthy um, estrogen balance. The other food, superfood, is organic green tea. Now, not everybody tolerates organic green tea, not everybody loves it, but for people who do, it's a, it can be a really powerful, potent compound. Um, it contains something called epigallocatechin gallate, which is a type of catechin, and this is a substance that supports hormone metabolism, 
Um, it also contains theanine, um, and theanine is commonly found in various supplements to, to calm anxiety. It can be helpful to sort of calm anxious feelings, um, we generally think of it as a calming compound. So the one thing about green tea is that it does contain caffeine. It doesn't contain as much as a cup of coffee, but for those that are sensitive to caffeine, um, you know, I say green tea might not be the best fit for you. And we'll talk about some other possible teas later on. Um, if you want to try drinking green tea, but you want to try to minimize your caffeine intake, I tell people, go ahead and, and brew the first cup. And by brewing it, I say soak a tea bag for about 30, maybe 60 seconds at the most, and then dump that first cup of tea. Then go ahead and add more hot water to that same tea bag. You'll get less caffeine in the second cup, but you'll still get the benefit, the beneficial substances in there. Um, and I also recommend with green tea not over brewing it. If you over brew it, it tends to taste really bitter uh, and not very pleasant. So if you brew it for between 30, maybe 90 seconds at the very most, you're gonna get a really nice tasting cup of tea. Other foods, the superfoods, foods that I really emphasize. So dark berries, which you know many of you might already be familiar with. And we're coming into berry season here in Minnesota. So it's a great time to take advantage of our local offerings. They're affordable, they're easy to find, and many more farmers are using healthy growing practices and growing without chemicals and pesticides. And these all contain many different bioflavonoids, which are antioxidants um, that help alleviate uh, inflammation, the effects of inflammation. Some of them um, also contain, are actually act as aromatase inhibitors, which again, help keep estrogen in check. Um, mushrooms, interestingly enough, those white button mushrooms, which a lot of times you sort of look at in the grocery store and you're like, what can those be good for? And I, I find it, a lot of people are surprised when I tell them actually, they can help uh, inhibit aromatase. Aromatase is this, enzyme in the body that converts substances to estrogen. And in some, in many cases, we are trying to regulate the levels of estrogen. Now, I don't want to make it sound like estrogen's all bad. It's not. We need certain amounts of estrogens to support heart health and brain health, but it's when we have too much estrogen in the body that it creates a pro-inflammatory state. So we always want it to be in balance. And then lastly, turmeric especially. I mean, all spices are great, but turmeric is sort of the, the queen spice here, which offers this really potent antioxidant and anti-inflammatory action. And so for those that love their curries, um, they often get plentiful amounts of turmeric, but this is becoming a fast-growing supplement that people will take in capsule form. Um, so oftentimes I have people asking me about this and I always explain to people, let's, you know, let's get it into your diet too, because that's another great way to get it into your body. So those are my main foods when I think of, okay, on top of adhering to some sort of anti-inflammatory eating, let's try to really make sure we're including these top foods. And so sometimes I have people pick just one group, maybe it's the vegetables here. And I say, try to get one serving of these each day, one hearty serving. And by hearty serving, I say aim for half a plate, you know, try to get half a plate in each day. For some people, it's like, why don't we try to get flax seeds in? Do it for, you know, every day for a month, see how you feel, see what you notice. So just briefly some ideas, because a lot of times people are like, well, what do I do with that? And I will tell you, for me, these are quick and simpler ideas. I always explain to people, you know, um, if you are a foodie and you really like to make different recipes and you like to get creative, I always say, I encourage that. That's great. Um, I try to keep things simple. Uh, what can people do and take with them on the go? So ground flax seeds can be added to smoothies. You can just put them on top of a salad or even sauteed vegetables. Um, I have a lot of people who will actually squish them into little nut butter balls. So they take like a, some type of nut butter, almond butter, peanut butter, cashew butter, and then add some flax seeds and some oats and they squish them all together. And then they take those with them to work or school and they eat them as a snack. It's a really nice energy, like high protein, and you get all the other benefits from the flax seeds. Um, vegetables, sauteed, steamed, roasted, whatever is easiest for you. When I steam them, I steam them for maybe five minutes. You know, I chop, chop up a bunch at the beginning of the week, 
take a bunch, put them into a steamer, let them steam for five minutes, heat up some other food, and then just eat them and go. And, you know, I say it doesn't have to be fancy. Just combine it with some brown rice and some protein, whatever that looks like for you. Berries, those are usually, um, you can eat them plain because they're so delicious. Um, some people like to add them to smoothies if they like to make smoothies. Um, sometimes I encourage people to eat, you know, especially during the winter time when berries are not, uh, they're not cheap. Um, and so they, it doesn't make sense to buy berries here in Minnesota when they're not in season, buy them fresh. So I encourage people to buy them frozen because they're a little bit more affordable. Um, and I say, you know, put some frozen berries into a mug and then add some non-dairy milk and some cinnamon and you've got yourself a really tasty, a sweeter treat that's nice and cooling for a summer day. Mushrooms are easily sauteed. You could grill portobellos on the grill, add them to a stir fry, eat it as a, a portobello, you know, burger if you wanted to. And then turmeric can be combined with other spaces as in a curry. So a lot of people who like um, curries and Indian food, you're in luck. Um, a lot of people are into making the golden milk. Uh, I'd encourage you, you can Google it and there's a plethora of golden milk recipes out there on the internet. Um, basically what it does is it takes turmeric and combines it with some type of milk and some ginger and maybe some honey um, to sweeten. And you've got yourself a really nice, calming, soothing drink uh, that's very anti-inflammatory. So a lot of people do it at night um, after dinner, after dinner drink. So those were all the foods that we definitely want to include to some degree. Now, a very common question I get from people is, what about wine? Because <laughs> um, wine, we hear all this back and forth about wine. It's, I'm supposed to drink wine every day. It's good for my heart. I'm not supposed to drink it. I don't know what to do. So I tell people, this is the way I explain it to people, you know, alcohol will increase estrogen levels for both males and females. So oftentimes if I see people who are having extreme symptoms of hormone imbalance or they're um, noticing some mood dysregulation and I'm suspicious that hormone imbalance is at the root of it, I'll ask them to cut back on alcohol intake for a while, um, even if they're not drinking very much, just because every person's sensitivity to alcohol is different. Um, and so it's good to kind of understand its impact on you. Um, we know that it will increase oxidative stress and inflammation in both the gut and the brain, um, but it doesn't mean no alcohol um, is recommended. I've, I've known plenty of people where they can drink, you know, one small glass of wine with dinner and it's absolutely fine. So I always explain to people, I'm not an all or nothing person. I'm all about what makes sense for the individual. But I do just try to explain to people because I've known many of people who come in and their routine is maybe two-ish glasses of say wine or beer a night, just as a way to sort of wind down at the end of the day. And so I really just step back and try to reflect on that and take a closer look at that. Like, what is that alcohol doing for you? Is it because you like it? Is it just because it's part of your culture? Is it because it's helping you wind down? If it's, if it's designed to help you wind down, we're gonna talk a little bit about what are some alternatives to that. Um, but I do explain, you know, I do remind people that one to three drinks a day can be okay, considered okay, at least from the, the medical perspective. But do remember that one drink is, is equivalent to five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, or one and a half ounces of distilled spirits. Now, the five ounces of wine is interesting because I always have to explain to people, let's go for a European glass of wine, not an American glass of wine. We tend to fill our cup quite full, and that counts as a glass, but really that's almost borderline two glasses. And then if you multiply that by two, you're actually getting a bit more than one to two drinks a day. So the one to three drinks, one to two drinks is traditionally thought of for females, uh, two to three for men per day. But again, I always say it depends on how large your drink is and the individual. So I say to people who are used to using alcohol to wind down at the end of the day, let's consider some non-alcoholic options. You know, one is the mocktail, which are becoming more popular. And you can make them fancy, you can make them simple, but many, if you decide to get into them and experiment with them, um, will include, you can include herbs that are calming to the nervous system. Um, so one example, this comes from the Herbal Academy. They did a great job of putting some examples online. So I encourage you to check it out if this sounds interesting to you. 
um, you know, they've juiced a little bit of organic ginger, uh, just finding ginger root at the store. You don't need a large amount. Um, they add some droppers of skullcap glycerite, which is a tincture. So a tincture bottle is like a small glass bottle and it will contain an extract of that herb. Now skullcap is a very calming herb. Um, and it also is helpful for uh, gastrointestinal regulation as well. And then they suggest adding it to 32 ounces of sparkling water. So this drink is not, you, it's not designed for you to drink all 32 ounces all at once, but it's uh, sort of, you could make this supply and then have, you know, a drink at night instead of maybe a glass of wine. And it probably tastes amazing. I haven't tried this specific one, but I've tried some others that are equally as good. For those that maybe aren't that interested in making a mocktail, um, I always say, look and see what's available over the counter. So just for full disclosure, I have no financial connection to any of these companies or any of these products. I, I, I've just seen them on the store shelf. I've had patients utilize them with um, and enjoy them. And so that's why I point them out. I also trust the quality of the products, but um, I don't have any financial relationship to any of them. Um, but what I do is I always point out to people, you know, we've got lots of stuff at our fingertips at the grocery store. Just take a look um, on the shelves where the teas are. And a lot of people commonly think of teas as all caffeinated, but there's not. There's a ton of herbal teas out there that do not contain any caffeine at all. And these are all really lovely. The ones that, you know, if I want to try to find something calming for people, I say, why don't you try to look for something like organic lemon balm? Um, it if you like the flavor or the scent of lemon, you'll enjoy this one. Um, holy basil is very common. It's a very good, it's a kind of an adaptogenic herb, which means it helps your body's resilience to stress. Um, linden and hawthorn are really lovely herbs as well. Very soothing, calming, heart healthy. Chamomile is very common. A lot of people really enjoy chamomile. I will say, um, I think chamomile is great for many people. I always do just watch, some people have ragweed allergies, and if they do, they might not enjoy chamomile as much as other people. Um, likewise, you know, some people, maybe during the summertime especially, it's just too hot out, they don't really wanna have a tea. I explain to them, you can always make these teas iced. You could put a bunch of tea bags in them, put it into a large container of water, set it out in the sun, do kind of a, a sun infusion, and then take out the tea bags and pour yourself some iced tea. Um, likewise, you could get some sparkling mineral water and then just get some digestive bitters over the counter at the grocery store, add, you know, half to one teaspoon of digestive bitters to a glass of sparkling mineral water, just gives it some flavor and you get a little bit of the benefit of the herbs. The amount of herbs, uh, dosage of herbs that you're going to get from these products from a cup, a single cup of tea or a single glass of water is not going to be th a therapeutic level. So I'm not as concerned about potential interactions. It's more if I, if someone's thinking, oh, I'm going to drink 10 glasses or 10 cups of lemon balm tea. Well, I'd say, you know, if you have a thyroid condition, I wouldn't recommend it if, um, because lemon balm can inhibit the thyroid. But again, that's in pretty large amounts. So I do explain that cautionary tale to people, um, but for the most part, the amount of the dosage you're gonna get from a single cup will be very minimal, so. Um, finally, you know, I wanna touch on endocrine disrupting chemicals. I think uh, people are becoming increasingly aware of these if you're not already, but I do like to touch on them because sometimes we forget about them and we overlook them. And I do think it's a, it's a good topic to cover because a lot of what I said is I, I do tend to focus a lot on managing stress with patients in order to help support balanced hormones. Um, but the other thing is sometimes it's vice versa. I want to really work on balancing hormones to help alleviate some of the stress to the brain chemistry and to our adrenals. And so in order to do that, I kind of step back and say, well, we know the body's, the human body's gonna make certain hormones and that's, that's supposed to happen. But what we want to do is try to reduce the amount our body is exposed to other substances that can look like uh, hormones. And so what we've come to understand these to be are endocrine disrupting chemicals. So they're, they're substances that were created, they go into a lot of different products that we interface with on a daily basis. Um, and what we found through many years of research is that 
some of these chemicals, when they go into the body and they start breaking down, look and act a lot like things like estrogens, except for they don't look exactly like estrogens. They just look close enough. And so then what happens is the body is thinking, I've got more estrogen on board and estrogen has a host of effects on tissues um, and the immune system and the heart system, like the cardiac system. Um, and so what happens is the body starts to feel a little overwhelmed by all that estrogen. And so this is why we've tried to help people understand and become more aware about different substances they might be um, in contact with that can really impact their overall levels of what we call xenoestrogens in their body. So things here, examples include DES, diethyl stilbestrol. That is sort of an older chemical that was used a long time ago. Then we realized that it caused birth, uh, you know, had created issues with people who were born from women who were, came into contact with DES or treated with it. So they stopped the use of that. Um, BPA, I think a lot of people now know they look for BPA-free plastics. So BPA is something that's commonly found in plastic bottles. It can also be found in certain cans, like it kind of lines the uh, can. So if you do canned vegetables or canned beans or anything like that, um, I always encourage people, you know, if you can, you know, try to find, see if it says BPA-free can. Um, and then phthalates and parabens, these are things that are commonly found in a lot of household products. Um, and so again, I think there's a growing number of companies that are realizing the impact that these chemicals can have on the human system. And so they are working to change how they make their products. And that's the great news. Um, but as I point out here, it's difficult to avoid all of these completely. It can feel kind of stressful, in fact, if you're like, oh my gosh, these chemicals are in everything. How am I supposed to avoid these? And the point is, is that we probably can't. And there's no point in adding more stress to your plate, thinking you have to, um, and worrying about it. But we try to identify what are the easiest, you know, sources that I can identify, and is it possible to phase those out? And what kind of alternatives do I have? So that's where I point people to the environmental working group. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Environmental Working Group, but it is a wonderful resource. It's a nonprofit. Um, they've been doing research for years on all of these things, um, endocrine disruptors. They also do research and come out annually with a dirty dozen and clean 15 list for fruits and vegetables. Um, I encourage people to use this resource. It is free. I mean, they will, they will point out when you go online to look something up, they'll say, hey, do you want to donate? Because it helps us do what we're doing, but there's no obligation and you have free access to all of their resources. So this is just one of them. It's a guide. It's a really nice, easy guide um, where it kind of points out the most common endocrine disruptors and how to avoid them. So they make it really consumer friendly. Um, and the website, as it implies down here, ewg.org, and when that pops up, you'll see a lot of different guides. Guides to healthy home, guide to the dirty dozen, clean 15 for foods, dirty dozen for endocrine deceptors. So it can be a little bit of a rabbit hole in terms of all the, the information you can come into contact with, but it's a really great resource. So just to recap, we, we blew through a lot of information and I, I know I haven't left quite as much time for questions today, um, given how ambitious I was, but um, recap, you know, I think when I sit down with people and I say it can feel overwhelming to try to balance your hormones and support your mental health, but let's, let's bring it back to the basics. One, schedule a little bit of time for some type of mindful activity. Doesn't have to be meditation. It could be, you know, taking a walk in the grass. Um, in your bare feet every day for five minutes. It could be just doing two or three deep belly breaths at your desk. Um, it could be getting up and rolling your shoulders out five times, really mindfully. Um, next, try to eat as many anti-inflammatory superfoods as possible each day. And then lastly, try to work towards reducing your exposure to endocrine disruptors. It's not gonna happen all at once. I let people know, but you know, just become familiar and take it one step at a time. Maybe you look at what's in your home first and then you say, oh, I can swap out this cleaner for a different cleaning agent. Or maybe it's avoiding touching receipts at the store too much because they can have chemicals on them and, and getting it emailed to you instead of a receipt. So there's lots of little tips that you can learn from going on to Environmental Working Group. Um, 
in, in terms of actions you can take as far as that goes. So I'll open it up. We just have a couple more minutes before um, we let you go today. If there are any questions, please go ahead and put them into the chat board. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Just as a reminder, if you are not already on our listserv, um, the psych wellness at umn.edu, if you wanna stay up to date with both links to these sessions so that you can view them afterwards. Also, if you wanna learn more about um, as we head back into the clinic and are offering services again, um, we've got acupuncture, naturopathic and functional medicine. Those are the two things I do, but we also will have individual mind-body sessions, health coaching sessions, um, so I encourage you, if that feels like the right fit for you, get on the listserv so that you can stay informed about those things. Phew! So that was a lot. Um, please go ahead. If you have questions, now's your time to put them out there. Um, and I'm happy to take some time to answer. Make sure I have my chat group up too. And just a reminder for those that joined us a little bit later, while I give people time in case anybody does have any questions from today. For those that joined us later, um, next week will not be meeting, but we will be meeting uh, the week after that. And the week after that, we're gonna talk about sleep, how to optimize sleep. Um, and also I was encouraging people at the very beginning of today's session, if you want to make sure you have a link to the playback of these videos, um, cause you just, can't get enough. You just want to hear me talk about it all over again. Um, and it's just so much fun. Um, go ahead and email the psych wellness at umn.edu. I know um, the links ha are supposed to be sent out at the end of each week. I, I, my understanding is they have been, but I think they're also being sent out with a lot of information. So if you're missing the links or if you haven't caught them yet, um, this is just a more direct way to get access to that link and so you don't miss it. Excellent. Well, you all have been great today. Um, if there are no questions, I'll go ahead and let you all ha enjoy the rest of your afternoon. I look forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks and thanks for, thanks for joining us today.